Well, good evening, Wilshire, and welcome to our uh, Wednesday night devotional. Thank you for clicking on or tuning in or whatever it is you did to join us. Thank you for your faithfulness in these online formats that we've been able to put up. Uh, we are grateful for your uh, willingness to do this. And thank you also for taking care of each other during this pandemic. I am sick of it. I know you're sick of it. But uh, thank you for continuing to wear your mask and continuing to social distance and do all of those things. Um, these are things that you do to protect yourself. But really, especially wearing that mask and so forth, those are things that you kind of do out of uh, protection for other people. And uh, not a one of us at Wilshire wants to feel like we contributed to getting someone else sick. So uh, I am grateful that you guys are, are willing to uh, show your concern for one another by doing that. Thank you. Well, tonight our devotional is actually taken out of um, Philippians chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, be turning to that. And it includes one of the crown jewels, I think, of the New Testament. And I've entitled this devotional, Get Over Yourself. Uh, and uh, I think you'll see why in just a moment. One of the crown jewels of the New Testament is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. This is called the Christ hymn. And I actually don't think Paul wrote it. I think he is quoting it. But I think uh, the early Christians were already using this in their worship services. I think this would have been sung or chanted. And it's just in just a few short lines, like a, seven verses here, you actually get the whole sort of Jesus story in a nutshell. Uh, he starts off, Paul says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And then he quotes their own song lyrics to them, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. and Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Uh, this is just a wonderful, wonderful song. Can you imagine singing that in the early church? Uh, the early church, which uh, in many ways feels like they don't have any citizenship at all. They feel estranged from the Jews. They feel estranged from the Gentiles. They feel estranged from the Roman Empire, these Philippian Christians are supposed to be Roman citizens. Many of them all have that citizenship legally, but becoming Christians puts strain on that. But then you get to sing this song about who Jesus is. He's the one that every knee will bend to. Uh, and every tongue, not just on earth, but in heaven and on earth and under the earth as well, uh, all the knees will bend, all the tongues will confess. You know, at the time that the Philippian Christians would have been singing this song about the greatness of Jesus Christ, the name that he has received, uh, Caesar would have been on his throne and people would have been praising him. And at least when his guards were looking, they would have bowed the knee and they would have confessed his name, Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. And here these Philippian Christians know a deeper truth. Caesar is only a little Lord over this little Roman Empire. And Jesus is the actual Lord over the entirety of the universe. He is the one in heaven, on earth, whatever is under the earth, he's Lord of all of it. And there's coming a day where everybody's going to see that and everybody's going to know and everybody's going to confess that Jesus is Lord. And so these Philippian Christians, when they sang that to each other, they were looking at each other and telling each other, there's our citizenship. 
That's the real citizenship we have in this amazing kingdom established by Jesus Christ. But what's really so powerful to me about the Christ hymn is it also tells why Jesus is so great, why he's received this name. The pathway is as important as the destination. How did Jesus become the one who has this exalted name uh, that we all belong to if we're part of the kingdom? And he did it by this amazing act of self-emptying. This is the passage that gives us this theology of Jesus Christ, equal with God, having equality with God. And he could have grabbed it. He could have exploited it the same way you and I have power and position, and we can grab it and we can exploit it and try to squeeze out all the advantages for ourselves that we uh, might like to. Uh, he had those kind of advantages far more than anything we could ever imagine. He's equal with God. And he could have grabbed it and exploited it and seized it, but instead, he let it go. He emptied himself of it. And he allowed himself to take on a far humbler form, a form of you, and a form of me. I, he... He became one of us. And in fact, he became a servant, not one of the nobility, not a Caesar on earth, not a commander of armies or a head of government. He became one of the humble of the earth, one that was at the disposal of those who were rich and powerful. And in fact, one who they could kill if they wanted to. And that's how his story ends. He humbled himself all the way down even to the point of death, even the horrible death on a cross. That's how he has this name that's above every name. That's how he gets to be the one that every tongue will confess and the one to whom every knee will one day bow. Okay, so that's this incredible Christ deal. Uh, you can imagine the heart that that put in the Philippians when they would sing that to each other. Jesus loves us so much that he emptied himself so he could save us. And now he is the emperor above all earthly emperors. He's the emperor of the universe, the king of the entire universe. And we belong to his kingdom. That's our citizenship. What's interesting to me is that Paul deploys the Christ hymn in order to make a point about how the church functions with each other. Because we started in verse 5, but there were four verses that come before verse 5 in chapter 2. And Paul is making an impassioned plea in these verses. He says to the Philippian Christians, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation from love, if there's any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion, any sympathy, Make my joy complete. Here's what I want you to do. Be of the same mind. Have the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. In other words, Paul uses this magnificent piece of poetry, the Christ hymn of Jesus, giving up his advantages of godhood to empty himself to become one of us so he could save us and bring us back to God. That's why he is the, the emperor of all emperors. He uses that to illustrate what you and I are supposed to do. In order for God to work in you, in order for God to work in me, we have to empty ourselves too. Even God cannot fill a full cup. And I'm going to be honest with you. There are a lot of days when I wake up and I pray, 
but I realize that most of what I'm praying for has to do with what I've already filled my time with. This is my project for you today, God. This is what I want you to accomplish today, God. Here's, let, me, let me lay out your agenda, God. These are the things I want you on board with. I'm already full of myself. And when I'm that full of myself, it's really hard for God to get in to my life. And so I need to make spaces of emptiness that God can come into and fill. And so do you, if you're at all like me. And that's particularly true when it comes to the way we relate to each other. That's what Paul's talking about in this in this uh, passage of scripture. It says, when you and I relate to each other, I can be super full of myself in all of my relationships with you, and that's going to constantly get in the way of what God's trying to do in my life and in your life and in what he's trying to do in the relationship we have with each other. So, Teachers have known this for a long, long time. A teacher uh, dealing with little kids or high school kids or college students can't just say, come up to my level, learn my vocabulary and my concepts, and then you'll know what I know. A teacher, the art of being a teacher is getting to what the students themselves will understand and, and translating those concepts over to them. I have to empty out myself so I can become a better teacher. And that's true with friendship. That's true with fellowship in the church. That's true with just about every relationship we can imagine. Uh, if I'm trying to, to make the world a better place, if I'm trying to make my relationship with you better, then part of that is going to be emptying myself of my own self-interest and putting your interests above mine. These last couple of weeks, I've been on the giving end and the receiving end several times of kind of painful conversations where there were things that were not okay and they needed to be addressed and they needed to be corrected. And those are, those are tough and awkward conversations to have. Uh, and I don't like it when somebody comes to me and tells me this is not okay and this needs to change. And I don't like even being the one that goes to someone else and says this is not okay and this really needs to change. But in both cases, what has to happen for the relationship to work is for the person receiving the rebuke, receiving the correction, to be willing to be emptied. And actually, it's true for the person who's giving it as well. If I come to you and say, this is what you're doing wrong, and it's all about me as I tell you that, you are very unlikely to take what I say seriously. And if you come to me and say, Jim, this is what you're doing wrong, I have to have the willingness to say, I got to get out of my own way. I got to get over my ego. I got to get over my stubbornness. I've got to get over the habits that I've formed and truly listen because maybe God is speaking to me through you so that I can do better in the future. I get so freaked out. Oh, I'm guilty. I've, I've committed a faux pas. I've committed a sin. I've committed something that's offended a brother or a sister. I freak out about that, but I really need your help and you need mine. And being able to empty myself is, is one of the Christian superpowers. It's modeled for us by Jesus. And Paul says, if you've got anything good going for you in Christianity, any encouragement, consolation, sharing of the Spirit, then get over yourself and let this unity of mind take hold of you so that we can have the kind of fellowship that we Brothers and sisters, that's what I hope for our church. That's what I hope for uh, the church worldwide. And step by step, I want us to get there. I hope you have a blessed, blessed rest of the week. Bye-bye.